So language-based learning disabilities are not as well understood as a category than, say, dyslexia, which actually is a subset of language-based learning disabilities. But um, one of the misunderstood things about LD schools is that there's some sort of magical, technical things that you do with those kids that you don't do with mainstream kids, when the actual truth is virtually everything we do is solid research-based pedagogy. The difference is, is an LD kid can't tolerate non-ideal teaching methods, whereas the non-struggling kid can. So we're really forced to be attentive to that research. So um, one arm of that research over the last three or so years has been the neuroscience that has been emerging with a couple of caveats. Uh, first of all, there's the tenuous connection between new research and practice, which you have to be careful about. So you want to be circumspect and discerning about what you choose, and then you want to back those choices up with some degree of action research or conversations within the school. Um, but it really centers around two broad categories uh, of the neuroscience. One is a set that actually validates what you're doing as a school already. And if you really look at 60 years of progressive pedagogy, the neuroscience is defending from a scientific perspective our need for exploration and collaboration and hands-on learning and all of those things that progressive schools have done for many, many years. We can now say the science backs that up. The second broad category would be the neuroscience that, that, that suggests there are things that we're not doing that we should be doing. And that boils down, I think, into a handful of big ticket items that we've been looking at. One is the inextricable connection between movement and cognition. And I mean that in the deepest, deepest possible way is that our brains evolved to think with physical bodies moving through three-dimensional space. And if you can operate from that, what you learn is that the sit-still model is actually working against the evolutionary structure of our brains. And if you can unlock that and get kids engaged, you're actually treating the brain with a little bit more respect. Um, another is the relationship between intense aerobic exercise and the development of intellect. And in fact, whereas we used, used to think that the brain had the number of cells that it did, and you probably killed some number of them off in college, um, but that it was fixed otherwise, what we now know is our brain does develop new neurons. What we've learned since then is that they actually are developed most heavily in the hippocampus, which is a major player in the, um, the memory and learning structure of the brain. And then, most excitingly, the new neurons sort of go to the head of the line to be used. So intense aerobic exercise literally grows the brain's capacity for learning. Um, and, and then there are probably two other sort of structural considerations that are important. One is the notion of plasticity, which is basically the brain changes and that you can change your own brain. And then next is this idea of we have all these cortical areas. We have sensory and motor and visual and auditory, but that literally and physically, the more of those um, cortical areas you use, the more bandwidth you're pumping into your brain, the deeper and greater the learning and actually the easier the access. So if you can move from a visual or auditory modality to one that involves much more movement, sound, engagement, you actually are literally increasing the brain's ability to learn that and retain that. Um, I would want to be careful. I'm not talking about learning styles because the research has not been kind to the notion that we have modalities that we learn in. We actually all use all modalities all the time. So um, all of that aside, some of the things we've been doing specifically are carving up the schedule so that we are allowing we still have PE every day, but we're also adding these punctuated breaks of aerobic activity during the day, and we're seeing some pretty good direct um, correlations to kids' ability to self-regulate and attend, even in some cases test performance, and I want to say that carefully because we're still in sort of an action research phase on that. We're teaching the kids directly about brain plasticity and, and multimodal learning with their cortex, and there's actually some interesting research that says that kids that are taught about the malleability of their own brain actually do better in school because they know they have the um, ability independently to change their brain. Um, I think Carol Dweck with Mindset backs up that idea and a number of other thinkers about um, our sense of control over our own learning versus the idea that we're either smart or we're not. And, um, and then in terms of rolling this idea out, we've, um, like most new things in schools, this has happened in a few pockets and we've now moved to the full faculty with some readings over the summer John Medina's book, Brain Rules, is a great sort of introductory primer, and we actually have our parents reading it as well, and are doing a series of book clubs throughout the year with this question, you know, what does this imply for education? And I think to be careful that there isn't anything 
terribly specific about any one piece of research, but I think if you look at the broad kind of research, some themes really do emerge. And Medina is, pro is probably a good starting place if you're new to that, because he is a skeptic about the applicability of the research to education, but he has 10 or 12 precepts that he says these things are fairly unassailable. Um, and they do match with a progressive approach to education and an engagement. They do align very well to some of the things we've heard at the SIS conference about the 21st century learning and collaboration and creativity and inventiveness. It turns out all of those things we're turning the boat toward for the 21st century are the things that our brains were designed to do 5,000 years ago where everyone was a, a dancer and a painter and a musician and a hunter and, um, and a weaver um, that we're learning that what we've done over the last hundred or so years in terms of education is actually working against um, some of the things our brains are wired to do well. And to come back to being a school for kids with learning differences, they don't tolerate that bad structural model. So in fact, for them, um, they probably would have done very well in a tribal society um, with all of those multimodal activities. And um, we're finding schools moving more and more towards realizing that the human condition really demands that kind of uh, experience. Hi, my name is Alan Broyles. I'm the assistant head of school and middle school principal at the Howard School, which is a K-12 school for kids with language-based learning differences. Kids have the brains they have. We often get kids uh, that if you look at their psychometric testing, their verbal skills, their perceptual reasoning, that is the mathematical side, are actually very, very strong. And I would, I would argue um, certainly comparable to kids that would be in some of the more mainstream independent schools. But in terms of the processing speed or working memory or some executive function pieces, they actually are not able to keep up with the pace and the volume. They are kids that if you give more time can come up with every bit of sophisticated an argument or a paper or a project, but the actual volume of homework or the number of topics that are ticked off in the course of a week or a month is more than they can keep up with. Um, but these are also kids that if they are, once they're freed from sort of the school structure, find their niche and are the insightful, wise ones and have this depth of thought and creativity that I think, in general, mainstream schools are missing out. Oh, <laughs>